lot to cover here in this video. Markets are coming back a little bit, but let's be honest, it's mainly just big tech. Some of this could have to do with the sell-off that we've seen in Asian markets. I'll explain why that is in this video. We also had some very bullish commentary from some Fed officials that really throws into question if the Fed's even deterred to slow down the pace of rate cuts at all. Of course, following the jobs report that we got last Friday. We have more updates from this Middle East conflict that could become a bigger problem. We also have some major economic data coming out tomorrow morning, and I will share the estimates with you in this video. So first things first, markets are to some degree bouncing back today, but it's a little... I guess confusing because mostly it's just big tech. If you strip out big tech here, markets really are not doing that well today. If you look at the RSP, the equal weight S&P, you're up a tenth of 1%, but the market cap weighted S&P is up 0.67%, mainly just being led by Nvidia up almost 4%, Apple up 1.5%, Microsoft up almost 1% and Meta, Amazon up around a half of 1% a piece. So how strong is today really? Well, it depends how you look at it. Part of this really has to do with the sell-off that we've seen in Asian markets overnight. Specifically, the Hong Kong stock market fell 9.5%, second worst day ever, and this is fueling some of this bullishness for our markets today, and here's why. Asian markets had one of the largest concentrations of short positions on them up until about two weeks ago when China started to stimulate and the Chinese stock market went through over a 20% rally in just a couple of days. That meant that short sellers that were on the wrong side of that trade started to get blown up. They had to sell stocks, mainly US-based companies, and boost up their reserves. Now that Asian markets have started to fall again, that means hedge funds and institutions on the wrong side of the China trade can go ahead and cover on those short positions and rebuy some of the stocks that they had previously sold. And you can clearly see the stocks with the most, you know, activity today being the big tech names were the ones that were being heavily collateral sized. But markets, generally speaking, are still pretty damn fearful. The VIX is still at 21.44. You're only down 5.3% today. So there's still a lot of fear in this market, which that's not exactly what you'll see if you look at CNN's fear and greed index. I'm recording this video sitting at 72, which is still pretty close to extreme greed. Now, Fed Kugler was one of the Fed officials that spoke this morning that caused markets to rally in part. Fed Kugler says, I want a balanced approach to make progress on inflation and avoid undesirable slowdown in jobs and economic growth. He says, if downside risks to employment escalates, cutting rates more quickly may be appropriate. He says, I don't know where the neutral rate is, but we are way above it. This was probably the biggest quote that really sent markets higher. Fed Kugler says, labor market cooling has started, but the Fed is looking at trends not single data. So that basically said last Friday's jobs report really didn't change much of the Fed's directional thinking. They're still gonna keep cutting rates pretty much as forecasted. But the bond market seems to be calling the bluff at least a little bit with 10-year treasury yields that are marginally moving higher today, now up to almost 4.03%. And last but not least, Fed Kugler says the healthy levels of job creation in last Friday's report are very welcome. Yet we really don't know how strong the labor market is because it was really the seasonal adjustments that caused that report to be so strong, specifically 750,000 teachers that went back to work. And did you know that corporate insiders have bought back the least amount of shares in a decade? Yeah, at the same time, Wall Street is super excited about buying these companies that we're going to have this soft landing. Insiders of these companies are not. They're doing the opposite. They're selling a lot of stock. In other breaking news today, it is being told that Israel will not target nuclear sites in Iran. 
I mean, that's good and all, but from an economic standpoint, this is more pressing. It says U.S. officials to NBC say that Israel is considering striking energy facilities in Iran. Also, part of the enthusiasm markets have today is oil that is falling about three dollars a barrel, down about four percent today. But this news came out that caused some of that to retrace back to the upside. And as I've explained now a couple of times here on this channel, this is the only thing that really you should even think about in regards to this Middle East situation. If energy markets are disrupted and the price of oil goes up, in any kind of material way, then that will cause a recession. That will slow down economic activity meaningfully. Now, it's not just the higher cost people are paying at the pumps, but it has a large psychological effect on people. When people start to, you know, see the price of gas go up, it it affects how they shop at Amazon. It affects what they buy at Walmart. It, it affects, you know, what they buy at gas stations, right? So on and so forth. It just affects overall consumer spending behaviors. And it is being reported that Netanyahu summoned the security cabinet for urgent consultations. But Israel has not briefed U.S. military officials on its plans for retaliation against Iran say U.S. officials. But now even the U.S. is considering getting involved in this. According to U.S. officials, the United States has discussed options for joining Israel's retaliation against Iran, including very limited strikes against targets inside of Iran, strikes against Iranian naval assets at sea, as well as the targeting of Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, IRGC sites in Syria and Yemen, though these are seen as less likely as opposed to just intelligent sharing. And last but not least, Jake Sullivan told Israeli officials that unless the U.S. is informed of Israel's plans for a potential attack, attack on Iran, it will not support efforts to counter another Iranian missile strike on Israel. This is according to Axios. So who in the hell knows what's going on? There's a lot of conflicting statements out there, but... One thing we know is this probably is not going to do anything for stock markets unless the energy market is targeted, which if Israel is not going to target nuclear facilities, then I'm sure oil facilities are probably in some capacity going to be targeted. So actually that headline that Israel will not target nuclear facilities has me a little bit more concerned that they will target energy infrastructure and oil infrastructure, which current could turn out to be a bigger problem for our markets. Now, throughout the rest of this week, you do have a couple of earnings. Tomorrow morning, you get Helen of Troy. Tomorrow and after hours, you get As, Bassinet, E2 Open, and Richardson Electronics. Thursday pre-market, Tilray, Delta, Domino's, Thera Technologies, and Neogen, as well as Ahir Test Systems Thursday and after hours. But really, the start of earnings season, beyond just you know a company, couple companies here and there, is the banks. And you have JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, BlackRock, BNY, Fastenal and Bank 7 that report Friday pre-market. And this is going to give us a little bit better of an understanding of the consumer, bank balances, spending behaviors, all of that. So I think markets are going to be intensely paying attention to bank earnings this earnings season. Now, tomorrow morning, we have Fed Logan that speaks at 9.15 in the morning. At 10 o'clock in the morning, you have wholesale inventories month over month. This will actually feed into GDP estimates. So as you can see here on the Atlanta Fed GDP Now tracker, uh, GDP Now, um, the next update is tomorrow morning, Wednesday, October 9th. If you see inventories um, go up more than expected, that is going to start to weigh on GDP. Now, Fed Barkin, Fed Goolsby also speak tomorrow morning. Um, and then you have the FOMC minutes that come out at 2 p.m. tomorrow. Now, I don't think this will be a huge catalyst for markets. There's the possibility that it could but markets normally don't respond too much to the FOMC minutes. It can cause a, a, a sharp reaction when it first comes out, and then markets kind of digest it, and it it usually turns into a bit of a nothing burger. Now, tomorrow morning, we will have a 10-year bond auction. The last bond auction we had for the 10-year was 3.64%. Now, 10-year Treasury yields are over 4%. So that yield's going to rise a lot. 
we want to see some good demand come in to keep those yields on the lower side. And that could bring down 10-year treasury yields. If we don't see good demand, then that could potentially raise 10-year treasury yields coming tomorrow. And that bond option is at 1 p.m. I think that will move the markets quite a bit. Now, you do have Fed Logan, Fed Williams, Fed Barkin, and Fed Jefferson, as well as Fed Collins and Fed Daly that speak tomorrow as well. So most Fed officials have a scheduled speak speech for tomorrow. Thursday is going to be your bigger day of economic data. You have core CPI month over month expecting 0.2%. Year over year expected to be 3.1%. Um, month over month headline expected at 0.1%. And inflation year over year on a headline basis expected at 2.3%. I actually think initial jobless claims might be the biggest catalyst of this week. You are expecting them to rise from 225000 to 230000 If that comes in even higher than 230000 that's where you're going to have a bit of the problem. Now, Nick Timmerhaus, as he always does, is posting the updates from major banks that um, post their CPI updates. And you can see headline CPI with, has a median forecast of up 0.09% for headline. Year over year headline has a median forecast of 2.3%. And Almost all firms are in agreement on that year-over-year -year headline number. Now, core CPI is expected to rise 0.26%, which would actually get rounded up to 0.3%. Now, for August, you were at 0.28%, which got rounded up to 0.3%. So as long as we come in lower than 0.28%, I think markets are going to be okay with that. You just don't want to string together too higher you know, inflation reports, right? Um, that's that's where things would be a little bit more problematic potentially for markets. Now, if we come in lower than that, that's going to be um, great news. Now, it looks like the highest estimate for month over month core is from UBS at 0.31%. The lowest estimate for core uh, month over month looks like it is Jeffries at 0.22%. So a lot of the estimates are pretty tight around about 0.27%, 0.25%. That's where you're getting that median of 0.26%. But some are higher, like JP Morgan is 0.29%. UBS again is 0.31%. You have Goldman Sachs is 0.28%. PNB Paribas is 0.29%. And even Bank of America at 0.29%. So there are some estimates that are quite a bit higher than 0.26%. Now take a listen to this clip posted to CNBC from Barclays Krishna that says he doesn't see the point in chasing the market when valuations are quote quite full approaching its second birthday where do we go from here joining us at post nine today Barclays head of US equity strategy Vinu Krishna has an S&P target of 5600 good to see you again Vinu. welcome good to see you you haven't been moved to increase your target like some others no why not well, I think let's see what happens in the earnings season to begin with. Uh, and if you see what's happening, uh, numbers have been cut quite sharply going in. Uh, and what is still anchoring the market is big tech, uh, even though their earnings themselves are kind of decelerating. Um, then seasonality, like October historically has been the weakest month. So you don't want to get sort of ahead of that. That said, you know, we are still optimistic. It's just that I think that uh, the, we have an upside case of 6,100, um, and of course we also have a downside case, but we think upside is relatively more likely than downside. Mm. So I don't see any point in chasing the market at this point when valuations are really quite full across the board. We're within about a percent of all-time highs on yeah. the major indices, but the only MAG-7 at 52-week highs or all-time highs is Meta, really. Do you think, you don't think the market's broadened out at all? Well, the market, in some ways, by some metrics, has broadened, right? So instead of only 20 or 25 percent companies beating the S&P, now it's about 40 percent, which is quite decent. Um, and the broadening in earnings is also taking place, but incremental. Uh, but the reality is the anchor for the market still remains big tech, which is essentially a conglomeration of just six stocks, right? Uh, and their earnings growth, despite moderating, is going to be more than four times that of rest of S&P. So I think that's where we, we sort of shake out. Mm. Do you think, I won't ask you whether 50 was a mistake, but do you, would you expect 50 again? No, we don't expect 50. 
Um, I wouldn't opine on the fact whether it was right or wrong because you can always do Monday morning quarterbacking, uh, right? So clearly they were focusing on the labor market and they wanted to be preemptive um, and they have a lot of wiggle room, right? Because inflation is coming down. So they have a lot of flexibility. That said, we don't think it's unlikely that they go ahead with 50 more. Uh, it's going to be probably, you know, 25, yeah. Are bond yields going to be a headwind if, if we stay higher for longer now? You know, we've done a lot of work on that. Interestingly, bond yields start really becoming a headwind once they're coming closer to the 5% level, right? So you could well have a situation in the fours where there's a positive correlation between equities and rates. And that's because look at what's happening on growth right now. Yeah. The economy is very strong. Inflation is decent. The job market is strong. The wages are going up, right? So any way you turn, things are okay. So I think the near term, you can expect a breather because I think we moved too fast too soon. Um, so but it's not yeah. everywhere. You know, it's been so confusing as to come on every day and talk about the economic signals because a lot of the data points are coming in good, sure, but manufacturing around the globe is pretty weak. We haven't seen expansion there in several months. And, you know, I, we'll have more on Pepsi later in the hour, but not painting a pretty strong picture of the U.S. consumer or the global consumer, especially at the low income level. So it's, confu it's sort of confusing. Yeah, it's a mixed bag. So I think you're right about manufacturing, but reality is the US economy is 70% services, only a third manufacturing. So that makes a difference. Um, services side is pretty strong. If you look at services PMI, they're extremely robust, <laughs> right? We just and, 18 months high. Right, yeah. right. And, and if you look at employment, the same story. It's weak in manufacturing, but very strong in services. On the consumer side, I agree with you, but it's a mixed bag over there. So those companies which have more of a brand or have some pricing power are able to hang in there, but a majority of them are struggling. In fact, we created a basket of stocks which we felt was more exposed to pricing risk, and that is lagging the market quite substantially over the last three months. So I think it is a mixed bag on the consumer side. And honestly, I just like that take because everyone's so bullish right now. He's like, hey, you really don't got to chase this market right now like let let things come to you see how q3 earnings are and i think that's a pretty good perspective i think a lot of people have forgotten just sound basic investment principles like War what warren buffett said once that always stuck with me he said it's more important when you buy a company than when you sell a company if you buy a company at the right price you're gonna make money if you buy a company at the wrong price, you may never make money. And, you know, especially picking stocks like we generally do, that's that's important. You you, you definitely don't want to buy at p precisely the wrong time. Um, and I although I think you'll do well in markets over coming years, I think there will be a better buying opportunity to come because the fact of the matter is the economy is slowing and even if it slows a little bit more, we're really just not priced for that. And that's that's the problem. So let me know what you guys think about this information down below in the comment section. Hit the like button as well as subscribe to the channel. You guys have a great rest of your day and I will see you in the next one.